Chapter 6 Wamas at Night Carlos parked the car near the wharf so we could look out onto the choppy sea. Eerie dry rocks and warehouses illuminated with white lights were silhouetted against the twilight sky. From somewhere on the ocean came the deep moans of a foghorn. The sounds drifted back to shore, carrying a somber mood. The only sound more lonely than a foghorn was the moaning of air brakes in the night as trucks come to a gradual halt. That sound always conjured up in me the image of vast flatland and a solitary driver without shelter or home. The air was cool. I wrapped the poncho around me to hold in the warmth. I remembered a crocheted afghan I had as a child, which had disappeared along with my other keepsakes, when Clara's cousin had put the things from my apartment into storage. Whoever had sorted out through my things had done a thorough job of wiping out the identity of the person to whom they belonged. They had deliberately discarded the items that had a personal significance, such as my photo album, the stuffed tiger from childhood, also my favorite suede jacket, and the karate uniform and black belt, which I had always worn for practice. What was packed in the storage boxes were items such as dishes, pots and pans, towels and clothes I had hardly worn. They could have belonged to anyone with no sense of personal history or individuality. I was in the midst of nostalgically mourning my loss when I saw a white envelope taped to one of the top box tops. Inside was a note from Nelida. It said, don't, warn, don't mourn your mementos. Then is then, now is now. Clipped to the card were seven crisp $100 bills. The implication being that I should buy whatever I needed. For a while, I just stood there with the note and bills in my hand. Then as it, bega as it began to calm down and assess the situation, I realized Nelida's masterful stalker's maneuver. She knew that I would have trouble parting with my mementos. So in one stroke, she had done it for me. The thought that I would never see her again made all my anger vanish and my attachment to things seem insignificant. Then and there, I promised to do whatever it took to break the hold that possessions had over me. I vowed with all my heart to fight coveting, greed, and self-pity. But as the days grew into months, my resolve weakened, for I was constantly bombarded by memories of the past and present influences that pulled me toward acquisition and attachment. It seemed I was waging a war impossible to win. We drove past the dark wharfs that cast massive black shadows on the pavement. I was thinking of Nelida's superb sense of detachment when I saw the flashing sign of a Ramada Inn. Carlos veered into its well-lit parking lot. We'll stay here for the night, if that's all right with you, he announced. We'll continue on to the Yaki towns in the morning. I waited in the car while he registered us. Then we drove around one of the wings of the main two-story building and parked again. The adjacent rooms were on the ground floor and opened onto a long covered corridor that led to a fenced off swimming pool area. Let's grab a bite to eat, he suggested. I know of a good restaurant near the center of town, which is only a few blocks from here. We can walk if you like. I'm not at all tired, I said, and meant it. I set my bag on the bed and looked in the bathroom mirror. I wanted to wash my hair, but Carlos had said to meet him in 15 minutes, and I didn't want to keep him waiting. 
Besides, I didn't want him to think I was one of these women who took hours priming in front of a mirror. Clara had cured me of that. Since there had been no mirrors in her house, I had gotten used to performing my daily hygiene with maximum efficiency. Carlos had also warned me from wearing makeup. Clara had also warned me from wearing makeup, which, she said, blocked the natural flow of energy around the face. The day after I had arrived at her house, she handed me a box of tissues and told me in no uncertain terms to wipe off my lipstick. I was embarrassed and infuriated, for it recalled a scene that had happened before in junior high school when a sister Beatrice came up to me in the hall, handed me a tissue, and made me wipe off the lipstick I had dabbed on. Now Clara was having me do the same thing, and I felt ridiculous. I'm free, white, and 21, I told her, and I'm definitely old enough to wear lipstick. It has nothing to do with age, Clara said adamantly. If you want to be a clown and paint your face, be my guest. But for storing energy, the skin, especially around the mouth, eyes, and forehead, has to be kept free from noxious substances. Even face lotion has to be used sparingly. She went into a lengthy digression of how chemicals, even in the so-called organic makeup, were absorbed by the skin and ingested, as in the case of lipstick, through contact with the tongue. What about mascara? I said, annoyed. Do you want me to look like a rabbit with pink eyes? Clara threw up her hands in exasperation. Better to resemble a rabbit than a bat from hell, she said. That black stuff runs all around the rim of your eyes because you're constantly rubbing them. Why not leave your face natural? There are no men around here for you to attract. If I don't put on some rouge, I'll look like death warmed over, I insisted. You look like death warmed over if you do put on rougette, Clara said as she slid my makeup kit off the counter into the trash bin. Stop using these, and the natural glow of your skin will shine through, and your color will return. Just think of how much time you'll save not having to worry about how you look. Besides, as I've said, you're not here to bag a man, which is what putting on makeup is all about. Am I right? She had a point. The fashion magazines and advertisements lead one to believe that a woman was not fully dressed unless she had makeup on. I decided to follow her suggestions. And after only two weeks, according to Clara, the pallor of my skin that had been systematically dulled had regained its natural sheen. I turned off the water faucet and put on some natural beeswax lip gloss, which being colorless and odorless did not, according to my scheme, fall into the category of makeup. Then, wrapped in my poncho, I waited for Carlos outside my door with a few minutes to spare. We walked to a plaza surrounded by an arcade of shops. The restaurant was on the ground floor of an old hotel. There were outdoor tables along the arcade, but most of people were sitting inside because of the brisk night air. A tall waiter dressed entirely in black, except for a white towel around his waist, seated us near a column that held up a mezzanine where musicians were playing a lively tune. I scrutinized the menu, but I couldn't decide what to order. When the waiter returned, Carlos ordered tried fried steak and rice and plenty of tortillas for both of us. 
Don't eat the tomatoes, he warned. When the waiter brought a small tomatoes and onion salad that apparently came with the meal. If I eat the tomatoes, will I die? I asked, concerned. I told him about what happened to an anthropology professor I once had. While trekking to the village where he was to conduct his fieldwork in New Guinea, he picked a ripe tomato fresh off the vine and ate it. An hour later, his whole body was covered with lumps and he fell into a coma. Four sure-footed Gururumba natives had to carry him down the mountainside in a makeshift stretcher where he was rushed to the local hospital. It turned out that the anthropologist was allergic to the toxins in that particular variety of tomato, and he nearly died. Nothing as dramatic as that, Carlos replied, but you'll no doubt get Montezuma's revenge. I've heard that can be pretty dramatic in itself, I said, moving the salad off to the side. We finished the steaks. It was delicious meat, marinated in a hot sauce with fried onions. Aren't you going to eat your rice? Carlos asked, pointing at the untouched pile of my, on my plate. I never eat rice. Is it against your religion? He teased. No, I just never eat it. Even as a child, my mother, knowing that I wouldn't eat rice, always made me mashed potatoes instead. I don't know why I didn't eat rice. I just didn't. Perhaps it was because you were a princess. I resented the insinuation of having been spoiled, which to me was the furthest thing from the truth. She just made me potatoes because she knew I wouldn't eat the rice. If you really want to know, rice reminded me of a pile of intestinal worms that when I looked down seemed to come alive in my plate. I just couldn't swallow them. Carlos peered at me and shook his head. An interesting case for Dr. Katz, he said gravely. Who's Dr. Katz? He's a psychiatrist I once worked for at the Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA. He used to interview patients and I would classify the recorded sessions in terms of a rigorous content analysis. You were at the MPI? I said, surprised. So was I. Small world. What were you in for? He asked, concerned. It struck me that he thought I had been at the Neuropsychiatric Institute as an inmate. I felt insulted for his lack of confidence in my sanity. I wasn't a patient, I said quickly to set the record straight. I was there to do research, just like yourself. Only I worked on a project involving autistic children. That sounds interesting, he said, helping himself to some of my rice. Actually, it was one of the most boring projects I've ever worked on. I moved my plate over to him so the grains wouldn't scatter all over the table. The object of the, of the research was to get the child to talk or rather to make phonemes. I had to sit in front of the child, who was in a small isolation booth with a window cut into it so he wouldn't become distracted. I would hold his face and say, look at me, look at me, say, mmm, mmm, mmm. The child would squirm and look away and try to get off his stool. Anything but make the sound mmm. If by chance he did make the sound mmm or something remotely similar, the procedure dictated that I pop an M&M candy into his mouth. Then I moved on to another phoneme. Phoneme. Repeating the words, look at me, look at me, say ah, ah, ah and so on for about an hour until I was reduced to a babbling idiot. Did you have much success with that approach? Carlos asked. 
Are you kidding? It was hopeless. I doubt any of the children ever learned to talk. Although I didn't stay with the project long enough to find out. I became so frustrated trying to get the child's attention and making all those weird sounds that I ended up eating most of the M&M candy myself. I suppose I was rewarding myself for the trouble I had getting the child to sit still. I have to admit that I put on quite a few extra pounds that summer. To me, those children were untrainable. I disagree, Carlos said. I had an autistic girl in my care, and after only several weeks, I actually got her to talk. I took her to the circus and the zoo. We had the best time. She talked, but only to me. I thought you did content analysis on tape interviews at the NPI, I said. I did that after I got fired working with autistic children, Carlos explained. The head of the project was furious because I treated the girl like a human being. I really liked her. To me, she was a fine human being, not just the subject in a case study. He probably envied your success, I said. I know how it is among researchers. Everyone wants to claim credit for any breakthrough. Carlos shrugged. He gave me a job in which I didn't interact with people directly. He had me listen to tapes of psychiatric sessions. I listened to hours and hours of people's complaints about every conceivable subject. Some of the problems were genuine, but most of the time just wanted attention. That's probably true, I said, soaking up the gravy with a bit of tortilla. Who doesn't want attention or, atten or affection? Carlos peered at me again. The real question is, he said, who is willing to give it? I have a friend who every morning opens his bedroom windows and yells, does anyone out there love me? At the top of his lungs. Of course, he hates his wife and everyone around him, but he wants unconditional love himself. You probably think that I never eat rice because I want attention, or perhaps love. I mumbled self-consciously. I wouldn't know, he said. You tell me. He looked at me in such a way I had to avert my eyes. Love, to me, was a delicate subject I didn't care to, di to discuss. By the way, do you eat corn? Carlos asked. The way he said it made me think he was trying to assess my psychological profile by means of food products. I have nothing against corn. In fact, it's my favorite vegetable, I said, exaggerating my fervor. Then let's have some pie made out of sweetened corn. When it arrived, I took a bite. Although I had never eaten corn as a dessert, I had to admit the pie was delicious. After Carlos paid the waiter, he suggested we take in a movie. I was too excited to sleep, so I agreed. Even though I assumed the film would be in Spanish, thereby difficult for me to understand. Several blocks from the restaurant was the, th the theater. Although it did not look like the movie theaters I was accustomed to seeing in the United States that had a marquee of flashing neon lights. It was an ordinary Spanish-style building with several posters on the front of it and a small window for a box office. I could tell from the posters that the coming attractions included a film with Charles Bronson and another with Cantiflas. You're in for a real treat, Carlos said. They're showing a kung fu movie. You told me you had studied martial arts. I was relieved, for in martial art movies, one didn't have to understand the language. The action spoke for itself. 
It was dark when we entered the theater. From the buzz of the people, I sensed the room was packed. When our eyes had become accustomed to the dark, Carlos led us to a back row where we found two empty seats. I was acutely aware of the smells around me. Someone behind me was coughing heavily. He must have been drinking too, for I sensed the distinct odor of alcohol coming from that direction. Worse yet, there was the smell of stale urine emanating from the back row. The feature had just begun. It was a Bruce Lee film, dubbed in Spanish. His dubbed voice didn't sound at all like Bruce Lee's own voice, which was a bit screechy, especially when he went into his vocal gyrations during his fighting routines. The dubbed voice was a deep baritone, very gruff, fitting the Mexican image of a kung fu fighter. But I soon grew accustomed to the voice and the odors and was captivated by the action. Bruce Lee was going through his elaborate nunchuck routine. The audience yelled, cheered, geared, and whistled unba unabashedly as he whipped the nunchucks under his arm with impressive speed. I could tell that the majority of the audience was male, but there were a few women in the group because their heads were leaning against their companion's shoulder. I surmised they were young couples out on dates. Weapons were something my purest Japanese instructors would teach only to male students. When I had asked my karate teacher, why couldn't I study weapons just like his male students? He took me into his private office and carefully explained to me the true meaning of karate. The character kara means empty, he said, whereas te means fist or hand. Thus, the essence of karate is empty hand fighting with no weapons. He made it clear that I should dedicate myself to learning the essence of karate and not worry about learning weapons, which weren't that useful in a woman's hands in the first place. The body is a weapon, he had said. It is a weapon of the highest order. Perfect it, and you will be in control of any situation. What if I'm walking down a dark alley and I'm attacked by a bunch of thugs, I asked. Will I be able to defend myself then? Why would you even think of walking down a dark alley? He said. The first rule of martial arts is to avoid trouble before it begins. He never told me how that was done because I'm sure he didn't know. But when I had asked Mr. Abular, how do you avoid trouble before it begins? He had replied, your energetic body will tell you where there is trouble. It's possible to see with your energetic body what goes on around you. Recapitulate and let the seer within, your, within you emerge and come to your rescue. He added that sorcerers who train the energetic body, or double, are able to go through walls or fly through the air and do all sorts of things the physical body couldn't do. Bruce Lee let out one of his stylized yelps as he incapacitated a pack of thugs with a series of perfectly placed flying kicks. I promised myself that upon returning to Los Angeles, I would begin a re regime of daily martial art practice, and I would resume recapitulating and I wasn't going to slow, slew off on the sorcery passes Clara had taught me either. I would make time to do them. I wanted more than anything for the seer in me to awake. I felt a draft on my neck. 
I thought they must have turned on the air conditioning full blast, although I didn't hear any motors running. I glanced up to see if any fans were going, but all I saw was a uniformly black ceiling painted with white streaks and some air conditioning ducts. Someone really messed up the ceiling with spray paint, was my thought. I returned my attention to the movie, but the draft didn't stop. Finally, I leaned over to Carlos. I don't suppose we could change seats, I whispered. The air conditioner is blowing right on my neck. Wamas gets pretty windy at night, he said, not taking his eyes off the movie. Windy? What wind? I looked up again and experienced a moment of total perceptual dissonance. I suddenly saw we were sitting out in the open, and what I had thought was a perfectly smooth surface with specks of paint was the sky. The paint were clumps of clouds, and the air ducts were shadows of trees. It was as if some force had come and lifted off the roof while I was watching the movie. I felt my stomach sink as when riding a fast-moving elevator. Simultaneously, the top of my head expanded upward in an acute physical distortion. I grabbed onto Carlos's arm for support, for I felt some part of me was shooing straight up, and I was ascending out of the theater into the air. There's no roof, I whispered. We're out in the open. Carlos turned to me and said, I thought you knew that when we came in. How was I supposed to know that? It was dark when we came in. I felt disgusted with myself at being caught unawares after I had agreed to be more attentive and ridiculous for not having noticed such an obvious fact as a missing ceiling. I knew in spite of my recapitulation, I still took everything for granted. Unless something actually hit me on the head, I didn't notice it. I blame my total stupor on my lazy middle-class upbringing. Having gone to Catholic schools, I was trained to obey authority without question. My entire life had been based on accepting dogma, on having faith in the world around me without ever thinking, exploring, or questioning my surroundings. Clara had warned me of this condition shortly after she had put me to recapitulate. She had said I had a sluggish, energetic body. In fact, one that was totally asleep. Your values were handed to you by your parents. The schools you went to, the culture in which you live, and by the force of reason itself which makes you powerless to move away from the expected, she had said. Unless you recapitulate your life, you will live and die the way your parents did. You don't have to look any further than your family to know what is waiting for you. Her words had given me a tremendous jolt because to repeat my parents' lives was the last thing I wanted to do. Yet in spite of the recapitulation, a mysterious force was still making me perceive in terms of a given mold. All theaters, according to my past experience, had had roofs on them, so the present one could be no exception. I didn't know what had made me suddenly realize that my assumption was faulty. Perhaps the same force that had made me put a roof over my head, now allowed me to see that there was no roof there. That was the mysterious force of intent that phenomenologists analyze and which sorcerers try to alter and disrupt through their practices. According to the phenomenologists, 
I had fleshed out perception and given it a spatial and temporal congruency. Perception came ready-made. All one had to do was to learn certain categories as a child, and the world was there in front of one's eyes, consistent and complete and unchangeable. It is up to the sorcerers to show us that that certainty is not all that there is to the world, that it is possible to alter perception, to break out of its bounds, and to create a different, yet still, consistent reality. I had once asked Clara why the layout of her house didn't seem stable, but shifting kept depending on form where one observed it. It's the sorcerer's intent that has constructed the house and has imbued it with power. It is permitted with a special kind of energy capable of transforming it from an ordinary house into a place of power. Perhaps one day you will construct your own house and place in it that special, inconceivable, sorcerer's intent. I wouldn't know how to do that, Clara, I said. I don't have any power. She laughed and said everyone has the power to stop their stupidity and indulgence, but that some people are too lazy or afraid to use it. Once one moves away, from the self by practicing the recapitulation and the sorcery passes and quieting the internal dialogue, one can intrinsically become something else. Just as the sorcerer's house had become something else under the powerful and impeccable intent of those that live in it. It was clear from her words that for sorcerers, perception held a different kind of intentionality, that different premises were used from the ones governing our everyday life. In a sorcerer's house, a wall could disappear, or perhaps a roof could fly off, or a door that wasn't there before could suddenly open. It would all be congruent with the sorcerer's way of perceiving. With his energetic configuration, which was lightness and fluidity itself. The barriers of perception were not rigid. I returned my attention to the film. My body was adjusting to the new parameters of my environment. Rather than feeling cooped up in a stuffy theater with the air conditioning blasting, I felt that the expanse above me was endless. The air was fresh, and the odors that had been so stifling before had completely vanished. Perception was indeed a limitless, mysterious affair. For out of the billions of possibilities that exist in the universe, man isolates only a few. It is his ability to select and isolate that gives him a sense of security, reduces dissonance, and enables him to live in what he believes is a relatively safe environment where death has no immediate place. Yet to move away from the known, one must, as the phenomenolo phenomenologists do, question one's basic taken-for-granted ways of perceiving. But to question the certainty of one's own reality, one needs a minimal chance to perceive it differently. Only then, one might learn something that one didn't already know, or see something one hadn't already seen. I realized then that what Clara and Emilito had tried to teach me was a new way of perceiving with the body a way in which the personal or psychological self did not take precedence. 
countless times they had tried to make me cognizant that there are other possibilities of perception open to us. Possibilities not included in our normal, everyday understanding of the world. They had insisted that by means of a thorough recapitulation of one's life, one could empty the warehouse of one's familiar items and venture into uncharted terrain. Letting go of the known and habitual was the key, they had said. Storing energy to move was the means. Of what do I let go? I kept insisting. Of your expectations. Of what others expect of you. In short, of everything you are, was, or hope to be. Clara had replied. Let go and allow the energy to work directly on your senses. Without interpreting and thinking with your puny mind. If you have to interpret, then use the sorcerer's way, which is to make your categories, then throw them away. Tell me, Clara, what exactly is a sorcerer? I had asked. A sorcerer is someone who, through discipline and conserving energy, is able to perceive more than the everyday world. She replied. Gradually, it became clear to me that sorcerers had their own way of perceiving and interpreting. The intent set up by a long line of sorcerers, each adding to it his own power, his own understanding, his own personal explanations, led to an alternate reality, just as real and predictable as the one into which we were born. One had to use sorcery to understand perception, then apply its techniques to break the barriers that keep us imprisoned. But are we forever condemned to explain and interpret the world? I asked. Clara shook her head. No. Finally, one arrives at the point where no explanation is needed or could ever be given. There, one stops thinking and silently immerses oneself in the mystery that surrounds us.